if you're not too caught up in that chase and in your own ego and everything, you actually learn to like really settle into the fact that you intellectually grasp, oh, I'm not comparing myself to what Ryan's doing. Whatever he he just did, like he's on his own path. And you, you find that it doesn't make you go like, what about me? I did do that at 25. And like now when I hear about that, I don't go like, <gasps> like what, what am I gonna do, you know? So yeah, when we talked last time, I was telling you that I was delaying the book almost a year and I turned it in yesterday. Yeah. Day before yesterday, which is about the year delay on the on the thing, which is a weird experience when you finish. Mm -hmm. And I know you just finished a special. So when you finish a special, do you have to toss? I do. It's done? Well, I don't, you don't toss it um, the moment that you're done shooting it. Yeah. Even though you're, you're, there's this thing that's great about it. You, it's probably the same way you, you view writing where you go, when you're done, like you can't manufacture being done, being the reality of being done. In other words, you can't go, I'll work on my next thing as I'm still working on this one. Yes. You know, like mm -hmm. you go like, no, no, once it's done, that's a reality. Yes. And then you go, okay, I've, that work is done. I can move on. So your, your brain when you do stand up, you you want to move on, right. right? You want to move on from the material. You want to create something else, but you're still performing this thing all the time, right? So when you're done with it, it's like your brain goes like, like it like relaxes, and you start to be able to create new stuff. But there's nothing like the day that it comes out, because that day and everyone knows you're done then everyone knows you're done and you go, I am never doing this again, right? Mm -hmm. So then it's a, it's like you, you've released it and yeah. you have this room in your head. Sure. That you can't, you can't artificially create the room. Yeah. It's, it's real that day. That's the great thing is you go, there's a panic of like, I don't have anything. Yeah. But it's also excitement because you go, I'm going to come up with something. You See. Know? I was just thinking about that because so I'm, I'm doing this four book series. So yeah. I just, I turned in on Tuesday, the third one. And, and the, how long have you been done with it? Like about a year, okay. like uh, more like eight months, eight, nine like months. Done. It was it, done. It was like the, it could have gone into production and instead I took eight, nine months. It would ultimately be a year delivery delay to just like fiddle with it and think about, just kind of let it sit and rest and go back. Did to your stuff. publisher's agents know that? Yeah, it was they like do. a whole is it, with publishing. It's like a contractual thing. So like we had to like amend a contract and okay. go. This is this was going to be delivered January first and come out. It, would, it should be coming out like in two weeks. Okay, that was the schedule was on. Instead, it's going to come out in the mid summer of twenty twenty four. I got you. Okay. So there's there's a lo a longer delay process on book publishing, but so I've been doing these four books, and so the big thing is like you finish a book, you don't get to go like I wonder what I'm going to do next. You're like, and you know what you have to do next, yeah. but you've been so preoccupied, you haven't been able to conceive of what that would actually be. You yeah. can't be planning for it at the same time. So I turn it in on Tuesday, and then I was riding my bike yesterday afternoon, and literally as I get to the end of the road where I turn around the structure of the fourth book, it just popped into my head. This this book that I didn't know how it would go, what it would look like, just all of a sudden, like, because it's going to be three parts, what the first part's going to be about, the second part's going to be, and the third part, and who the characters will be. It just happened. And it felt, so, it was such an illustration of exactly what you're talking about, which is your mind can't move on to the next thing until you have some sort of closure mm -hmm. or finish. Like you, there's, there shouldn't be a reason that you shouldn't be able to think of new material. Right. But because you have this lane in your mind, it's not till that ends that the, the, the engine that generates the new stuff just kicks on immediately. Yeah. I heard this one uh, writer, a comedy writer, and I wish I could credit the person because I don't remember who said it, but he was like, cause you do this thing when you at least write jokes where you go like, oh, uh like you save this one for this yeah yeah and hold on to this one oh that all that i'll use for that and he was like don't do that never never do that he was like just and he, i think he was talking also about writing it might have been for like live to maybe snl or something so he was like sometimes you go like this one i'll save like put if it's a joke it's good you like it yeah. you put it in 
and you know let it get turned down or let it bomb but don't save the mm. joke um and i i i think that's like a a good less like what what you, we end up doing in in stand up with specials is like you you end up performing things you go just per, perform all of it then when you're in the edit you can cut things out which is the way to go i always tell cuz some of my i've had friends who are like I'm going to shoot. I think I'll shoot. I go, dude, shoot all of it. Shoot. Cause it's right. very easy to go. Sure. Hey, just cut that out. And it'll be like, it'll be seamless. You won't be able to see it, but you don't want to wish you had shot it too. When I wrote the daily stoke eight years ago, I had this crazy idea that I would just keep it going. The book was 366 meditations, but I'd write one more every single day and I'd give it away for free as an email. I thought maybe a few people would sign up. Couldn't have even comprehended a future in which three quarters of a million people would get this email every single day and would for almost a decade. If you want to get the email, if you want to be part of a community that is the largest group of Stoics ever assembled in human history, I'd love for you to join us. You can sign up and get the email totally for free. No spam. You can unsubscribe whenever you want at dailystoic.com slash email. Well, actually, I, what I think the common thread of all of that is if you're it's like you want to be intentional, but if you're too intentional, mm -hmm. you're just like getting up and you're you're like get too much in your own head about it. Yeah. Which is like the less precious you are if you're just like make all the stuff yeah. and then figure it out later. Like there's definitely been there's chapter there was a chapter that was in the first book in the series, in the courage book, that I moved to the discipline book mm -hmm. that while I was writing the discipline book, I moved to the justice book. Oh. So like it kept not and now it's like perfect right there. Yeah. There's been some chapters where in retrospect, I wish I'd kept them out. Of, like I yeah. wish, I wish I had saved it. Uh -huh. So it's for, it, it was, it was a different way of thinking about things because usually you're just able to, like you're only working on the one project you are. But if you have sold it, like if you're, if you're working on a television series and you know the arc of the show, you don't want to waste stuff in season one that actually makes more sense. Sure. So that, you do have to yeah. think about arcs, but yeah. I think if you're too, if you're too like, well, what are they going to think about this? Yeah. What you're not thinking about is like, what is best right now? Like what's exciting, what's interesting and just do that. Yeah, especially if the other thing is like, if you're excited about it, and then this probably applies more to jokes than like story and arc, you know, structure of, uh, of how a story should go. But like in a joke, if you're excited about it, you just gotta let it rip, you know. Yeah. I had a I have a a bit that I was touring with and I recorded in the special Disgraceful, which came out in 2018. I cut it out of the special and I was like, I don't know, I just like something about me. Yeah. Just, and so you I always listen to that voice if it's like some type of doubt. So I cut it out. And I did it a little bit on the next tour, and then I shot it, which was the next special was Ball Hog. And then I cut it out again. Yeah. And then I tweaked it again. But I didn't really do it much on this last tour. I did it a few times, like, you know, sparingly in, on certain shows. And then I don't think I shot it. I don't think I shot it. And so I am I now have a new hour. Yeah. Since um, Sledgehammer came out, I have a new hour. The, the, a full hour of new material. A already. full hour of new material. Because it's been in the can for how long? Sledgehammer. Sledgehammer came out 4th of July. No, but how long was it in the can from oh. recording to release? Um, it, it was shot in November. Okay. So that's, yeah, I don't think people fully realize how much space there is. So that, as soon as that floodgate opened of you could create new stuff, I mean, even in, from there until it came out, that was yeah. several months. That was several months. Although your my most creative time is after the special came out. So honestly, sure. the, the the last eight weeks, I've generated more than in the previous six, yeah. seven months. Because right? there's a period of rest and recovery yeah. and then you're excited And then again. you get in creative mode. And then now I'm in, um, I'm still, I would say, in a creative mode. Because it's not like, oh, my hour's great. I yeah. hope you check it out and love it. It's like, I feel like it's like, you know, 60 to 70% there. And then it needs a lot of tweaking yeah. and it needs new stuff and I need to drop stuff. But that one bit that I've told you I've been doing is currently at the moment the closer. You uh, know? That's so like I've I've taken it and I've tweaked it and I've moved it several times. And right now I'm closing with it. 
Interesting. Well, yeah. I bet I bet there's probably so the the scary thing is starting at zero, right? Mm -hmm. And so having something that you move from place is is kind of, I would imagine kind of a hack yeah. to just not feel like you have nothing. Yeah, yeah, it is. And yeah. generally, by the way, when you finish a special, you go, "All right, well, I'm not including these five things." So you have them. Yes. For the next thing, your B sides start the thing. And I did the thing this time that I've never done before, which is I asked Netflix. I was like, "Can I just um, release those as like?" online content yeah and they were like sure so as bonus material yeah and so we put it on youtube instagram TikTok. it got millions of views and then i was like oh that's gone like i don't get to use that anymore. you know what oh I mean? yeah you were burning the boats in a different way but i i did it to myself yeah. and i knew what i was doing yeah but i think i just also was just like i just want it out you know fresh start fresh start yeah, yeah. well we were looking at that hemingway print in my yeah. office this is the first draft of anything is shit and my actually my writing one of my uh, old editors is the one who designed that and he he made it so like even we could have he made it so it's imagining hemingway even workshopping yeah. that line yeah um but i think you're like i have an hour that's like for me that's like i know what the book is and i have most of the content there yeah but that's in some ways not the easy part but it's like it's just this the first mountain is just like getting it all down mm -hmm. and then figuring out what it is and refining it and improving it and working and working that that's in some ways the harder but maybe even the more important part yeah and right now i'm, I'm at this part which i mean i'm sure there's a um a similarity in in writing a book but i have this problem area yeah where i've had this bit land well and land horribly Sure. Which tells me something, right? When I, yeah. I've done this long enough where like I can analyze it. Yeah. A is that you know that that bit is not bulletproof, which you want you want your bits to be pretty bulletproof. Sure. Meaning if you're not performing it perfectly, the writing is so strong that it still yeah. lands. It still sure. gets it still gets the laughs. But this is not this section that I'm talking about is very delicate. And if I'm not like perfect performing it, then it falls apart, mm. which lets me know that there is work to do, yeah. right? And that I, I, I'm, I'm having to like, like I've thought about abandoning the bit, which mm. is always it's also a sign where you later on you're like, oh, but I sh like, that means I'm scared, you yeah, know? yeah. And then I think about like, okay, maybe my approach in, so I tried a new way in because the way in kind of sets everything up. Um, and right now I'm just like, yeah, I don't have it figured out, you know, but I still want to keep working it that's what i found like with this extra year or whatever is it just it, it allowed me to go back over it so many more times which could be a problem potentially because you can you can get too self-indulgent too up in your own head or whatever but mm -hmm. but like it, i would read it and then i'd be like where do i find myself skimming my own book and yeah. then it's like okay that needs to be 10 or 20 percent shorter uh -huh. or like where am i fine i would just where where can i connect things better together or just just sort of going through and going yeah it's working some of the times yeah. not other times and then i i always i like to show stuff to people and go like what parts don't you like yeah and then it's not that i cut those parts but yeah. then i fix I, what you're telling me is some you're there's a writing rule i like which is um if somebody tells you something's wrong they're almost always right mm -hmm. if they tell you how to fix it they're almost always wrong Ah. And so like ha that something is That's wrong like is great. correct. Yeah. But if they knew how to fix it, they would be in doing your job. Right, you right. know how to fix it. Right. Like it's your thing. And so it's like noted, like I, I heard the problem, but like I have to go under the hood and figure out what it is. And yeah. it, it may be that it shouldn't be in there at all, or it's just, it's not doing what I want it to do. It's a really good point. And I really wish like now I can, you know, I, I actually have the ability to critically analyze notes my my own stuff you yeah. know like i could i like this last special i was really happy with the fact that i was less precious than in pre it took me all this time to be like oh we need to cut things yeah like before i'd be like just fuck print like yeah. just go with it yeah 76 minutes long great and i was like no it's too long like i i would go like when i would look back at those earlier ones i would go like i should have cut this this and this but I, I didn't do that until 
later on, like later on, a few years later, I was go, I'd go, oh, this is too long. But that must have been really hard because the the I think I saw two clips that got cut and they're both really fucking good. They did hit, they hit really strong. Yeah. But for some reason it was easy. To was, cut them? It was easy for me, yeah. Is that because you're less precious or? I just was able to go, like I made, I made very swift decisions about, like, mm. so one of them, what um it was had a it was a bit that originated during COVID. Yeah. And like when it came like when even when by the time I came up to shooting it, I was like, I started to feel that like That's this, the one about the going to your kid's school yeah, and is But yes, you feel yes, like this I don't wash my hands that much. Yeah. yeah. You feel like this funk in yeah. you when when you're um when something starts to feel dated. Yeah. And so like as in the months leading up to taping, I was already like, you know, it's like it was late twenty twenty two. Yeah. No one's really doing this. And yeah, then Jim Gaffigan's new special, he opens in a mask mm -hmm. and it's kind of a funny joke, mm -hmm. but it felt very dated. It was, it was, a, it was an interesting choice. Yeah. I mean, look, here's the thing. Every comedian has bits about it. Like yeah. we always talk about whatever's the going on. The biggest thing that happens. Sure. Yeah. So we all do it. And then it just is, but for me, when I got to the, so I shot it and I felt a certain way. And in the edit, when I was like, I want this to be 60 minutes. Why the, 60 minutes? I just felt, I I feel like I learned on tour and touring for all these years. The first thing you do is you go, you're trying, you know, when you're starting out as a stand, you're trying to build material. I have five minutes, I have 15 minutes, I have, yeah. I have a half hour, I have an hour. And then you get into this thing where you're like, somebody's like, I, I, do, I can do 80 minutes. Yeah. You're like, oh shit, you can do 80 minutes? Sure. And then you're like figuring out that the more you tour and do it, the longer you can do. Yeah. So there's there's nights I've done 85, 90 minutes, you know, right. on stage. And you realize part of that's kind of like just ego of like, look how long I can be up here. Yeah. And no one can make me leave. No one can make me leave. And the audience is staying. And then, but I what I realized is that, I mean, this is my take on it. Uh, no one really wants you to be up there that long. <laughs> like there's a reason why. Sure. There's a reason why the, the clubs start booking you and they go, can you do 45 to 60? Right? Yeah. That's a headlining time. Ultimately, what I realized is that if you hammer it, like kill it for between 60 and 70 minutes, when you say good night, people pop out of their seats. They pop up. Right. And, they, and they're also like, is this over? Yeah. Right? Essentially saying, I wish this were longer. Yes. And then when you do 90 minutes and, and you're doing one, this is not like kind of like you're, you're killing, but like 90 is a different ride. You yes. know, it's like there's, there's peaks and valleys you see. And I've, I've seen these shows too, even as like an audience member, you see people that you go good night at 90 and they go, <laughs> and they kind of get up like sure. slowly. And you're like, Oh, like that's a lot. That's 50% more time in their seat. It's a long time. So when I was watching specials, I, even now when specials come out, sometimes I'll see the runtime and I'm like, fuck it, 82 minutes or like yeah. 77 minutes. And I realized that like, if you can deliver 60 minutes hard, which is like, which is like the stand up time for, an, for a headliner yeah. and you hit it pretty, like pretty tight, it would kind of convey that same feeling of like, that's, that's it. It's over. It's an hour. It's like, it's the, it's the amount of, time that i think is perfect to deliver so it was my goal it was my sure. goal to try to like and even if it's arbitrary the forcing function of a yeah. time limit forced you probably to be harder on yourself and just to make decisions and make them quickly yeah and i like i mean i cut that COVID thing i felt great about it it was like they're like all right you just lost like four and a half minutes i was like great yeah and then i just started like looking at other bits and just trying to figure out what could go that's what i did with this year i cut almost 8,000 words, which is 10% of the whole thing. Yeah. Just slowly, you're just cutting. And I, I was adding stuff in also, so I was cutting more. Like the nice part about editing when you're writing is you can put more You can stuff put more, in. yeah. So you're like, okay, it's 10% shorter, but it's it's also better because yeah. it's more, there's more sort of uh, bang for your buck in there. But like I reread, I reread The Obstacles Away to my son at some point during the pandemic, he wanted to like read something I'd written. And and so I read it to him and I was like, this is fast. Like, yeah. I was like, this is so short and it, it's like, it would be like a band listening to their first album or yeah. something. You're just like, there's no, there's just no fat in it at all. Yeah. 
And I struggled with it in two ways. One, it was like, I was jealous. I was like, this is so short and tight and fast. It's like probably 50,000 words. Whereas like this book, 72, 73, something mm -hmm. like that. I was like, damn. And then the other part of me though, is like the reason it's long, like I, I go back and forth. Am I, is it getting longer because I'm being less critical of myself, less uh, lowering my standards, like getting more self-indulgent or is it actually that one, I'm better and I have more to say. And two, I, I won't, I think, right. One, one of the things you learn as you get older is that shit's more complicated yeah, and it's more nuanced and things you would have said when you were younger, you would never allow yourself to say because you know, it's not a honest. Or, and so, so like you're getting long, are you getting longer because you're a windbag or are you getting longer because you're more honest you and are. fair it's, it's and, that. and that tension it could be one it, it for one joke it could be one thing for another joke it could be other and knowing the difference yeah. is really hard that's totally and everything you're saying about like you, the truth is you are better you're you see the world differently through a different lens you're wiser yeah and so the way you approach your writing is going to be that way the same way that like you know, I was watching stand up the other day. I was at the club in uh, in Austin at the mothership there, mm -hmm. and we were on the balcony. Uh, Andrew Santino and I. We were watching one of the younger guys, and I was like, "Do you remember?" Because he was he was doing this thing where he was he was getting laughs, but it was it was so early stand up way of yeah of presenting. I was like, oh, you remember having bits like this? And he was like, oh, yeah. It was, it, it was so indicative, not just of this guy, but of that time in your life as a yes. stand-up. It was that type of stand-up. And I was like, like, he and I were like, we, we don't do bits like this anymore. Yeah. But we were both like reminiscing. Like, I remember being 24. Yes. And that this was my approach to stand-up. Yeah, like a 26-year-old giving you advice, writing about overcoming obstacles. I'm, I'm... I'm definitely deficient in empathy, understanding, yeah. nuance. Like there's yeah. a bunch of ways in which what I'm saying is not incorrect, but it's incomplete. It's incomplete. But you also like, as you think about obstacles or just life, you know, at your age now, you realize how difficult life can be yes. for people. Yes. And things that like, when you're young, you're like, I can't like, I can't believe that person did that when yes. you're... I can 40, totally believe it now. You're like, you're like, oh yeah, that's, people go through this and yes. people make these types of mistakes and like uh, everything, every story that I once was like, seriously, like yeah. you just go like, yeah, <laughs> yeah this is course. just yeah, the norm. Yeah, you realize it's, it's there's a, it's like, uh, I, I, I experienced that a lot recently, uh, a, a lot where like, you're like a customer at a grocery store and you're like, why is it this dumb way? Yeah. And then you have, then you learn something about the economics of that business. Sure. And you're like, oh, it makes oh, total sense. Yeah, and then this is the way it works. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It, like, yeah. And I imagine as a comedian, a lot of the things that drive you nuts as you get older and you experience more, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm making fun of the wrong person here. Yeah. Like oh, I'm yeah. making fun of the Vic, uh, us, a. Uh, uh, also a victim of this yeah. problem. The real problem is several layers up sure. above. And the other way that you learn to joke is that, you, if you're making fun of the victim, you, you, there's a wink yes, where you're acknowledging that to the audience that, you know, you're making fun of the wrong person. So like, you're still allowed to do it, yeah. but your awareness changes. Yeah. Right. So you're just kind of like, right. And then yeah. all of a sudden everyone's like, well, he knows he's making fun of the wrong person. Therefore it's kind of funny and still allowed. Yeah. You're realizing it's, op you're, you're operating on multiple levels because you realize the world is operating on multiple levels. Yeah. And so you can't, say it in a sentence anymore. By it's the way, more. I have to point this out to you. When you when we sat down here, I'm like, man, I keep rubbing my eyes, you know? Yeah. Like I'm fucking rubbing it. Is it over. the dust? No, no. So I'm like thinking, I'm like, the fuck is going on? And then I realize that just out of almost courtesy or whatever, when we got, you're like, how are you with cats? I'm like, fine. And I, I just didn't tell you I'm highly allergic to cats. <laughs> <laughs> And that's definitely why I keep rubbing my eyes. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. We're going to no, lock okay. them up. No, it's all good. I just thought it was funny that I, I was like, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> but you did feel comfortable enough to tell me you don't like Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, but here's the thing. Okay, I, 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 point, I like to point this out. It's not that I don't like him. What I've found, and this is through living life and just, yeah. is that people, everybody has um, 
a feeling and experience with things that they enjoy. Mm -hmm. Movie, especially when it comes to like the entertainment, right? Yeah. Movies, shows, musicians. And there are people who I've met so many who will, as an example, will be like, oh, Bruce Springsteen, like it's, he's the shit, man. Yes. And you're like, okay. Um, and then you check it out and yeah. you go like. I don't get it. You, you needed, needed to get it go, when you were like 16. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. like, sounds fine. Yeah. And then they're like, did you? And you're like, you know, I heard it. Um, and it's like, it's not, I don't dislike him. Yeah. It amuses, like it's almost funny to me how I see somebody almost lose their mind to something that I just, it doesn't affect me, right? Yeah. So I was in uh, I was in Europe on tour the same time as him and we were hitting the same, some of the same cities. Yeah. And one night, I think we were in Dublin and we had actually had a night off and they were like, hey, you can uh, you can go see Springsteen tonight. Yeah. Like come in through the back, stand on the side of the stage, like yeah. super wow. VIP. Jeez. And I was like, oh, no, I'm good. And they were like, excuse me? And I was like... This I is like meeting the president. Yeah, How I was dare like, you? Yeah. I, was like I, I go, well, I mean, it'd, it'd be a wasted thing on me. Like, yeah. And I've had people be like, yeah, but well, here's what you need to do. Yeah. You need to check out this 1977 yeah. show of the thing. And I look at the thing and I'm like, it's very nice. Yeah. Um, it just, I don't, I don't hate the guy yeah. or dislike what he does or think that he's not talented. I'm saying that it just doesn't have the same effect. And here's the best part. The next day was my show. And he came? No, but oh. like a bunch of the East Street band came. <laughs> and they were like, I was like, I didn't even know you guys were here. <laughs> One of my favorite things that Charlemagne does is he pretends that he doesn't know who the Beatles are. That's funny. And it just drives white people like absolutely the insane. Who? Yeah. Yeah, what? Yeah. Oh, are they good? You yeah. Know? In spring, there's a couple acts that I, I'm a, a fan of Springsteen, just like as a fan of Springsteen, not like he changed. My, I, I think not being an East Coast person, he, d he doesn't mean anything to me as like a yeah. person, you know? I just think he's a, I, I like his music. But yeah, that, look, that man, is, a, that's actually. You and about 55 million other people. Like, well, that book, the book I was recommending to you is called Deliver Me From Nowhere. And it's about, which actually, we should talk about this. So it's about uh, the recording of the album Nebraska, mm -hmm. which, so he does, um, what does he do? He does Born to Run, which is his sort of first like big breakthrough albums, first number like uh, charting album. And then, so they think he should do like another huge E Street Band album. And instead he goes into his bathroom and he basically records on a four track recorder in the 1980s. So should he, he records these demos of these songs and he thinks they're going to be E Street Band songs. Like He's just recording the sort of solo, yeah. like demo versions, and then they're all going to go. So they go into the studio and none of them work. They don't work together. And so he could throw them all out or rewrite them to work. Instead, he's like, let's just put it out as it is. So he puts out Nebraska. Which, which is the bathroom recordings? Basically the bathroom recordings. So it's, it's actually this, maybe one of the most punk things in the history of music. You have this guy, an ascendant musician, who's about to put out like, a follow-up to his huge album. And he just does the opposite of what everyone's gonna think. Yeah. And like it they can't even they can't even remix the four track because like techno it, it yeah. becomes this extremely difficult album to master, comes out, and then it it blows people away because it's so different. Um, but the the sort of twist on all that is the one song that uh that doesn't make the album is born in the USA which you can hear the Nebraska version. And then that's the one that he keeps, saves for later, to go uh, to what we're saying about how you should never yeah. do that, saves it for later. And then the whole album is built around that as an E Street Band song, which becomes one of the biggest songs of all time. So that's the one that he cut out. He didn't He didn't do the sort of acoustic, yeah. like low end, sort of sad, depressive, a different version of Bruce Springsteen. He That song gets saved and becomes what it was ultimately actually meant to become, which is the big sort of upbeat. Cause, cause that's the other thing is right. Like everyone thought uh, Born in the USA was like Reagan used it as like a campaign song and Bruce Springsteen's like, this is about this. the opposite of, I, of I that. This, like yeah. I fucking hate you. <laughs> Those stories are always great too when the politicians 
just use a song and, and you're like, almost you almost always seeing yeah. s- seems like the band goes could you not yes like, we yes. don't want you to play this yeah yeah who's that guy you just introduced him on stage uh, uh oh yeah uh, um uh oliver anthony yeah he was like no it's about the republicans at yeah. the debate uh it's hilarious yes. yeah um he's such a uh an innocent it's so crazy i don't know if anybody can quite relate to this kid's experience yeah because he was like unknown eight weeks ago i know and now he's like a political prop basically and and he's just like uh i'm not you know i didn't want to part in any of your guys thing i'm just i'm a, i like to make music and yeah the only thing i think about that one though is it's like it's supposed to be this like sort of working class song yeah and it's like but like the core of it is like about how he doesn't like fat people on welfare there is a meanness to that song. is it yeah it's about a 300 pound person on welfare eat you know, buying fudge rounds with their welfare checks. But isn't he saying in that song that like, though that those men in Washington aren't helping the person who is in that situation? He's saying my money shouldn't pay for your fudge rounds. That's oh. what it says in the song. There's a, a there's a mean part in it too. Hmm. So I think I think he kind of I think he was like kind of repeating just random stuff. Like I think in that he's kind of repeating like a, it's not a right wing talking point, but he's repeating something that like people say. Mm-hmm. But when you hear it as music, you're like, that's fucking mean. Oh wow. Um, anyways, well, I don't really listen to lyrics that much. <laughs> yeah, I didn't totally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but anyways, the the point is, uh, it's a, it's a good example of like he takes Bruce Springsteen takes this hard left turn, mm-hmm. which. Uh, the the guy in the book the the book is all about the making of Nebraska, but he talks about he basically says that um, that Nebraska is the pulling back of the bow, and then born in the USA is the release of the bow. Mm-hmm. And so he does the it, it's this crazy kind of jujitsu move because everyone thinks he's going to do one thing, he does the opposite, and then he goes does the opposite of the opposite. And had he gone uh, born to run, uh, born in the USA it maybe wouldn't have worked. It's that he has this sure. detour in the middle that makes it yeah. so explosive. And then Nebraska becomes this sort of cult favorite under It's like, it's a musician's 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 album. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? It's yeah, like, yeah. It's all the, all, the, all the artists say it's his best album. And it's the, um, you know, when you have the, it's so exciting. Like one of the more exciting things, even not being familiar with it, in art is making decisions that are unexpected and just saying, yeah. I want to do this when you think I'm going to do this, pivoting, yeah. you know. It's like the thing that I love about, one of the things I love about being a, a comic and is that you're an entrepreneur yeah. and that you can just make choices yes. to do what you want to do, you know. Yeah, it's like uh, there, you have the space, it's your thing. No one's really telling you what to do. Yeah. And and so you have you have to make those decisions. Because yeah. like they, they like the, the, the so there are other people involved, they're never gonna tell you to do something crazy or unpredictable because if it doesn't work, they get fired. Oh yeah. Nobody wants to suggest the idea that gets them yelled no, at. All the suggestions are like how to make it much safer and here's and, what people normally do in yes. your position. Yeah. I could tell you, oh my God, so many times in development it's just in tv development specifically it just gets watered the fuck down to the like when you're like why is why are all these shows such bullshit yeah so bad yeah and it's in it's because of those meetings it is a thousand percent like you and here's the thing they tell you when you start guess what we're gonna let you do whatever you want to do of course and you're like really and you get all excited by it and they're like yeah this is gonna be yours it's gonna be the ryan show and you're like, that sounds cool. And then you just start handing in drafts and hearing these notes. And you're like, this feels like the same dumb shit that I see all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. And then the final thing looks nothing like what you wanted. Well, I think the trouble is, so it's like, it's it's a given that most things are not going to work. Right. Right. So like, they're not judged on success or failure. Yeah. Because they can't be, right? Because yeah. they assume a lot of times it's not going to work even if it was good. Yeah. And so... What are they like? How do you evaluate? How does that person in the meeting's boss evaluate them? It becomes like, did they say dumb things in the meet? Like, do you know what I mean? It becomes just this sort of like safe safeness and mm-hmm. like not wanting to rock. The, you just you just want to, you know, it's not going to work, but you don't want it to work, not work in such a way that retroactively you're the person that gets fired sure. for it. 
And also you have to realize that when you're in these, you don't realize this when you start, that the people who are sitting around giving you the notes have to justify the salaries that they get yes. from these huge studios that are often pretty hefty salaries. Yeah. And if they're just like, you're funny, you're good, just I, I trust you, they'd be like, what the fuck do we need you for? Right. So that person has to give you all these notes that go, you go like, uh, this doesn't really feel right. But isn't that a tricky thing with ego too? Because like, if you're like, I'm a person, I don't take notes, I'm the expert, mm -hmm. you can't tell me anything, that person usually ends up crashing and totally. burning. Yeah. And then if you're the person who takes all the notes, that's how you end up with this sort of dog shit, yep. middle of the road, There's compromise a, on everything. And so knowing like what notes to take and when to listen, that's so hard. That's a skill set, right? Yeah. Like I feel like it's it's a skill set that you're constantly evolving yes. and learning to do better. And I feel like, you know, it's it's what I love about producing things. Um whether like, you know, I have TV projects, movie projects, those are very collaborative. Yeah. In stand-up, you learn to trust. Uh, obviously, you, you have a trust with an audience in a way, right? It's an unspoken thing where you're sure. like, well, this is killing. Yeah. It works. This is bombing. It doesn't. Um, but you also have like friends, right? Comedians, sure. I do, that you're like, they're watching and they kind of go like, mm, you know, like, that's not great. And then you go like, oh, I... I believe them. Yeah. Uh, or this thing's great, and but you need, like you're saying, you need to figure out something here. And you, you trust their voice, right? Yeah. The one that was really interesting to, to me that you've experienced far more was in writing my book. Yeah. Because when I wrote the book, my previous writing experience was all television stuff. Yeah. You know, I'd written, I'd been a writer on like Comedy Central pilots and... Uh, network stuff. I've I'd done pilots for both uh, cable and networks. So those were all my writing and all the, a lot of the notes you're like, oh, it's yes. brutal. So I was writing um, this thing and I sent it off to the publisher the first time and I was like, here we fucking go. Yeah. And I could just tell immediately when I got her notes back that I was like, oh, these are great notes. Oh, sure. And, and so I was like very excited. Yeah. Like I, she didn't, I don't feel like ever mislead me or like make it corny or like she elevated what I did. And yeah. I was like, oh, these are great notes, which I was really thankful for. Yeah. It's like when I started in publishing, you know, the editor knows more than you, right? Yeah. The person knows more than you and they know, and you only know a little bit about yourself. Right. And then as you go, you get more experienced, you learn more. You also have a certain track record and you know your audience because you're the only one talking to the audience. And so it's this weird thing that's happened in mine. I was actually just talking to, because my editor now is the publisher. Oh, sorry, I said public. Well, yeah, she's yeah. my editor. The editor but, is, yeah, yeah. but now my editor is the, also the head of the publisher. Oh. And so it's this weird thing where, like, um, he doesn't give me notes. At like, all. Basically none. And I had to go, like, I, I enjoy that. Yeah. I do know what I'm doing. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't want to get myself in trouble where... Right. Um, yeah, I want it to still be tight. I still want it to, I want to be challenged. So I'm having to work out this like tension. This new book that I'm starting now will be the first one where I had zero editors involved. Like I, I had, I used to work with this sort of other editor like outside and we're not working together anymore. And so this is the first one where it's like, oh, there's no guardrails. And so I'm going to have to create some guardrails. And no, like no one, like nobody will read and go like, good or like well it's like you know, like i submitted the manuscript and then like i'll get an email be like oh i like this maybe tighten here and maybe do this that's but it. it's like an email wow. not like line by line and there's yeah. copy editing and later stuff for like factuals but like no one's like hey dude like i'm not sure this works right you know like no one no one wants to and no one in uh on in your life on your side like friends like does a read where they give you a, a well opinion? it's like i have to now i have yeah. to I have you to voluntarily that. submit to that process. Yeah. Whereas you could see, and you can see how, if you were not interested in that, how oh, yeah. not, you're not going to immediately crash and burn, but you could, you can drift. And yeah. this is how you get indulgent. This is how you say things you shouldn't. This is yeah, how you get sure. lazy. Yeah. And no one tells you that you're falling off, but you're falling off because like, you're not going through the same process anymore. That's what's crazy when you learn about the um, the directors who have that. Yes. When they're like, here's the cut. Yes. And and the studio has to go like, 
all right. Right. Like, I mean, there's a few, it's like a handful because everybody else gets a heavy handed. Yes. You need to do this and this, this is too much and cut this. And like, there's those like eight directors where they're like, I'll give it to you when it's done. <laughs> and you think you want that. But yeah. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I don't know. I think I can see how you would want that more as, as you progress, right? Yeah. Like as you learn and get better at the craft. Yeah. But I still think even, I mean, with movies too, you're not going to be like, no one's seen, you're going to, you, those, even those guys have their trusted producers and inner yeah. circle who are watching cuts with them. Yeah. But still like, they're just like, nah, this is your, you're printing. This is it. Yeah. Like this is the movie. Yeah. And then, I mean, the internet adds to that too. Like at least with publishing or a special, like there's still this, all these pro like, you know, maybe the sound guy's gonna be like, hey, I don't know about that. Like you can still just get ancillary feedback, but what's hard about like the internet or video, like you can just put shit up. Mm -hmm. And so you see how people get in trouble because like they're just not thinking about how people are gonna receive this sure. in any way. And once it's out, you can't like take it back out. Yeah, you, know? you can't, yeah. You didn't, you didn't workshop it. It's just yeah. straight off the top of your head. I mean, I definitely like having uh input valued input yeah i don't want meaningless sure. thoughtless yeah fun, you know but like when somebody is putting critical thought into it yeah i i enjoy yeah uh and then and then it's also weird because the audience interact like was it weird for you when you cut those pieces from the special and then they blew up did you question whether you should have cut them at all <sighs> for like i mean some of them i i think there was three that i put out i would say that um briefly for a second i'm like should i have but then i felt i still realized that i was like no i felt good about mm. the decision when i did it and i'm happy with the final product so i'm like you know the main thing was like i i wanted the stuff to live somewhere yes and i didn't feel like here's the other thing is i didn't i think what made me go put this out i didn't want to carry it over like you know right. i didn't i didn't feel good about hey i toured I did 300 shows with this. Now I want to start my next hour. With, I was like, I want to release it. Right. Um, and I'm not bothered by the fact that it's not in the special. Well, that's another <laughs> tricky thing though, right? It's like, so you make the decision is you think it's right. And then the audience gives it like the thumbs up, thumbs yeah, down. Yeah. And that doesn't change whether it's good or not. No, that's true. Yeah. And I did get a lot of like, why the hell would you cut this? Yeah. You know, this was the best part. And I'm like, I felt like it wasn't. Was, so. And, and there you're like it wasn't what i was trying to do in the special yeah exactly it was, it was good and that it got lots of views right but it wasn't the hour that i was trying to make exactly and i and i look back at other specials and the thing that i used to like sign off on leaving it in did it get laughs yes then you go leave it in right and then you know a year or two or more later you look back and you're like that didn't contribute anything to the special other than it got laughs but i don't feel like like it didn't make the special better. Yeah. And if I had cut that thing that got laughs, it doesn't make the special worse. So it doesn't belong. I feel like that's that's one component of mastery or, or real expertise at something is the ability to actually know what you're doing mm -hmm. and what you're trying to do. Yeah. Right. So it's like, um, there's a difference between like, I'm trying to put out something that's funny mm -hmm. and then this is the special that I am making. So like, yeah. I found, and this was some of my clashes with an earlier editor that I had, which is like, if I didn't know what the book I was trying to make was, I was just trying to make a book, but I didn't know, no, this is the book I make. I could make any book and I know I could do this idea this way or this way, but the one that gets me excited that I've decided I want to do with this chunk of life that I'm giving it to is this. Mm -hmm. So like your notes that help me do that, I'm interested in. And the notes that don't are irrelevant. Yeah. And they're not right or wrong. They're just not here nor there. And so if you can go like, hey, this is what I'm trying to accomplish here, then it makes it easier to make decisions about include it, not include it. Mm -hmm. And I think people are bad at this with life as a whole. They don't know what they want their life to be, like yeah. what what like what success is. Yeah. So they just go, Well, someone offered me a lot of money to do X, or it's unpleasant to do Y. Yeah. And so that that's actually sometimes you do unpleasant things to get to a place you want to get and sometimes you turn down lots of money yeah. or a cool opportunity because it gets you far away from where you want to go but if you don't have a sense of where you're trying to end up you're just making these individual decisions and you don't actually have the perspective to know what the 
best choice is. Yeah, you're, t you're totally right. And it's very hard to be able to see clearly all those things when you're 25. Yes. 20, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. at this age, I can look back and go, oh, I understand why someone is in, unaware or not yet there to make those decisions, which makes the people that are 25 and able to see that all the more impressive. In, in a way, I mean, I, I do remember having some of that clarity yeah. because when I was um, 21 and I was doing real estate in Boston, I remember being like, you know, you, you rent apartments, yeah. you, you show people the yeah. apartment and you get a, a crazy fee. Yeah. And for a kid, I'm six weeks out of college. Yeah. Some of my weekly checks were two grand, 2,500. I'm like, this is fucking this is a life. wild. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I remember getting to September and being like, yeah, but I, like, I was just, it was eating me up that I wasn't performing. Yeah. But not performing comedy. And so I was like, I'm, I'm moving to LA. And they were like, you, you just made like, you know, I forget how much it yeah. was in a few weeks, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars It was clear I was going to make, I was going to be 21 and be making $150,000. Yeah. And now I didn't get that money yet, but it just felt like the writing was sure. on the wall on that. And I just was like, yeah, but I don't want to be showing apartments. Yeah. Even for the money. You yeah, know. sometimes it's this kind of vague, almost immature sense. Yeah, but I, I remember as I my in a good chunk of my twenties, I was in, in I worked at American Apparel. I was just marketing director, and I had this cool job. I was like the director of marketing at a publicly traded company, like in my early twenties. Yeah, it was a cool. Everyone thought it was a, it was a cool American brand. American Apparel was like yeah. cool as shit. Yeah, and I remember I went to this every week. I would every year I would go to this conference in in New York called Ad Week, and uh, I'm. I, I went the first year. It was sort of cool. I'm the youngest person there probably. Next year I went. The third year I go, I'm sort of looking around and everyone's wearing suits and I'm not. Mm -hmm. And I just remember going, if I keep coming to this, one year I'm going to show up in a suit. Yep. And I was like, I don't want to be a person that wears a suit. That yep. is like, and so that's very immature. Like now, if something, if there was something important I wanted to do and I had to put on a suit or if I had to provide for my kids wearing a suit, I would not. Hesitate, I, I, would, yeah. I wouldn't hesitate. But then I was just like, I don't want to be a suit you don't person. Because the thing is, you don't want to be that guy. I don't want yeah. to be that guy. Yeah. And maybe that guy's really happy and awesome and does good yeah. work. But I had some visceral disdain for yeah. what they represented. And it was all dudes, pretty much. Uh, and I was like, I don't want that. So I was like, I got to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Like, I got to start making decisions. And so, yeah, if you don't have this sense of where you want to end up, you end up just taking things that are cool or exciting or where you're getting some traction or momentum. But, but this, that's getting you far away from where you ultimately want to end up. This leads me to this kind of thought for you, though, and, and maybe because you have an answer on this, because I, I feel like I really knew that I want to do I want to perform? Yeah, right? I didn't know I wanted to stand up at the time. Thought maybe I want to act, but I, I knew I knew that. But for what do you say to people? Because I imagine, and I've heard people be like, "I don't know, I don't know what I want to do." Yeah, what do you tell them when they're being like, "Yeah, you're right, you're right," and, and that I don't know where I want to end up. I, I don't know where I want to end up. Yeah, and in uh, Robert Greene's mastery, he talks about like your sort of life's task. Like, how do you find what that thing is? People go like, "What's my passion?" He, he's basically saying, I think it's true. It's, it usually goes back to some point in your childhood or early teen years, you discovered this thing that like lit you up, mm -hmm. that got you excited. And then there was some part of you that said, this is impractical, this is impossible, this is too hard. And you turned away from that. Yeah. And it's, it's usually not that you don't know what it is. It's that you've decided that it can't be something that you've already Right. You know what I mean? Oh, so so I, you're almost like your brain is blocking it. Well, it's obviously not photography. Yes. So but like, it's yeah. photography. Right, and, right. And like, I knew I loved books. I wanted to be a right. writer. I had done this stuff to fund being a writer. It was like, it's time. I got to right. go get serious about this thing. And that, like, I ended up quitting and moving across the country like maybe six, eight months right. later. Um, and here's the thing is all those stories, right? Like, yeah. they sound insane. Like, yeah. now it doesn't because you're this wildly out. successful. Yeah. But, but right, you tell somebody, I quit this and I packed up and they're like, it's fucking stupid. Right. So like you should, if you're listening or watching, you got to remember that like it might look, it probably will look crazy or stupid to a lot of people for you to pursue the thing that you really want to do, you know? Well, and I would say one, th one way to handle that is 
just don't fucking tell people. That, like, I agree. Like I 100% agree with that. I, I'm, I wanted to leave Los Angeles, so I didn't bump into people I knew, be like, I'm going to be a writer, you know? And yeah. Like, well, what happened to that guy, right? Yeah. And and I didn't want to I didn't want to be sucked back in. So we, my wife and I we moved to New Orleans, and I was still like freelancing and consulting on stuff. So like I just told people I was doing that. Yeah. And so it wasn't until the book was announced, like it had been sold, and there was news stories about it, that my my friends were there were like, "Oh, you're working on a book." You yeah. Know? And I realized like they didn't care. Yeah, they just yeah. thought I because it was New Orleans. They just thought I was like a bum, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that like self-consciousness is the enemy. Mm -hmm. And so like, if you're, uh, there's two ways, right? If you're the person who's like, I'm working on a book and it's it's gonna be a huge success, you're probably an egomaniac and you are yeah. you actually suck, you yeah. know, and it's not gonna work. Um, like I'm moving to LA to be famous. Like you probably, yeah. aren't, it's not gonna work out for Good you. Good luck. Um, and then, uh, or when people say it's not gonna work out for you, you feel that so deeply that it, it affects you, right? Yeah. Like I didn't, I, I didn't want people to be like, you, you're gonna do that? Yeah, you don't know sure. how hard it is? So I just was doing it quietly. Yeah. And it wasn't until I was, I had done it that I talked about it. And so I wasn't like susceptible to either judgment or ego or anything. I was just like doing the thing. That's such an important thing. I mean, every time somebody goes, I'm doing stand up for the first time, you know what the, the don't tell anyone. I go, don't invite anybody. Yes. And they're like, what? I go, don't invite people. Like, don't tell your friends and stuff. Go, go, if you really want to do this, just go do it. Yeah. Don't invite people for a while. Yes. Like just go do stand up then because you don't want it to be a thing where, and by the way, I made the mistake completely unaware the first time I did stand up. I told people. Yeah. And here's the thing I didn't tell them I'm going to do stand up for the first time. I was like, I'm doing stand up. Like I do stand up. Right. And so they were like, oh, I didn't know you do stand up. And I was like, yeah, me neither. You know? You're borrowing against work you haven't done. Yeah. 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 So they just came, they all came. They're like, I didn't know Tom does stand up. And I was my first time on stage. Yeah. So dumb. <laughs> oh, it's, it, yeah. And if it works, it's a bad, it's a problem. And if it doesn't work, it's yeah. a problem. And it basically was right in the middle. Yeah. Where like, I got some laughs and I got some, you know, like strange looks. Yeah. It was enough where I wanted to do it again. Mm -hmm. But everybody was like, all right. Didn't know what to think about that. I even think about it like if you are good at something and you're successful and you're just like expanding into something different. Like, so I was successful writing and I was like, video is huge. I'm going to start doing videos. Like mm -hmm. I, you don't go, Hey everyone, look at me. Yeah, I'm oh, starting yeah. to do videos. Yes. Check it out. Like, like, no, I start these things independently on yeah. the side yeah. and you like, like first, like I remember when we first started doing like TikToks and Instagram reels for Daily Stoke, I was like, here's what we're going to do. Go take interviews that I've already done from the eight, yeah. nine years I've been doing this, cut those into pieces. Let's put those up and let's let it accumulate a little bit of an audience on its own. Mm -hmm. Because what I don't want, what the hardest thing to do is to do shit for nobody, for yeah. an empty room. So it's like, let's build up an audience. So then when I do sit down and record something in the camera, I don't have the extra shame of going like, uh, six people are gonna watch this. Sure. And, and so I kind of try to build I build my way into stuff and I, but I also kind of build separately. Yeah. Because that that like, oh, I'm I'm quitting my job to be a YouTuber now. It's like then you're gonna have to deal with the humiliation of waking up every day and having four hundred subscribers. And you're either gonna you're either gonna delude yourself about it, which is dangerous, yep. or you're gonna feel like garbage. Instead, you should have like kept working your job and just been making stuff yes. on the side under some pseudonym or whatever, and then transition once it's viable. Another thing I screwed up on. Yeah. Um, yeah. I did that so poorly and not unaware. Like, you know, you do it unaware. What yeah. I did was, well, I was, I was doing it where I was doing stand up and had a full time job. Yeah. And I was, that's the way to do it. Yeah. Of you course. know, and I'm supporting myself with my job and doing stand up. And your whole goal at this age, I'm 26, 27, is to get with one of the big management companies. Yeah. Even more so than an agent because the mm. managers and stand up, because they do like bookings and stuff. Well, the managers are like the big ones are hold so much power and they're able to they just they can they can make they can really make things happen for comics. They're connected to those agents. Yeah. They're connected to the festivals. They know all the executives at sure. the networks. They know the director like they so when I got signed by a uh, a big time management company I was like, oh man, it's like, and this was like who everyone was saying, like, you got to try yeah. to get with these people. I was like really 
feeling myself. Yeah. I was supposed to start a on a new show. I was working in post production, and this was going to be like a pretty big like, post you work in for set runs. Like this would be a twelve week or sixteen week kind of run. And I was gonna, I got a promotion, and they were going to give me overtime for the first time. Yeah. And they would work us like dogs. And I just walked into my post supervisor, and I was like, "Hey, man, you know this thing happened yesterday. I signed with a manager. I was like, so I'm not going to be able to." Like you, I've made it. I've made it because I have yeah. a manager. Yeah. And then I remember I call. I was like, yeah, yeah. He goes, oh, you have an audition for this movie tomorrow. It's the first time I had like a big yeah. audition. And I was like, yeah, yeah. I quit my job. And he goes, what? <laughs> and I go, I quit my job. He goes, why? And I go, because I'm working with you now. And he yeah. was like, oh, okay. Um, well, we'll see how that. Go-. Like he didn't know what to say. Yeah. And I was like, oh man, I, I just cut <laughs> like yeah. my life support. <laughs> No, I, I, I feel like I accidentally did that. Like, like I bought my first house, like with my, my pay stubs, not my like 1099. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, like, I was like a regular person living life. And mm-hmm. then I had this artistic thing on the side that eventually overtook it. Yeah. And yeah, you want, like, you want to give yourself as much runway as possible. And I don't think people understand. It's like, if you blow up your life to pursue this thing which it sometimes you have to do to get out of stuff sure but it's like you're not going to have the leverage to not do shit that you don't want to do or mm-hmm. that you shouldn't do because mm-hmm. you don't have any money and you literally need to live you know like i i got offered the first book my first sort of offer to do a book came in like 2008 or 2009 oh and the ops which what which i ultimately did with the obstacles away but the obstacles away didn't come out until 2014. Yeah, I was gonna say, okay. And Robert Greene, who was my sort of mentor, was like, you have to turn this down. And I was like, are you kidding me? He's like, first off, it's a shitty deal. Like they're offering you no money up front. It's not like a big publisher. Like he's like, but that all aside, content wise, like you're not ready to do this. And that was extremely hard. Like you're getting your shot and I have to like be like, I'll wait for a later shot that might not come around. It's the hardest thing. It was so hard, but he was totally right because if I was, if I'm now looking back at the obstacle and what is the way, and I'm like, I'm a little young, Mm -hmm. it would have been insane to write that at 22 or something like that. You're lucky that he told you, but you're luckier that you listened. Yes. Um, And I, uh, it's a hard, I remember a very similar lesson. Everything was, there was a a period where now it's like specials come out every week and you can self-produce and it's easier to, and it's fantastic. Yeah for those comedians and also for stand-up comedy. It's great that you have yeah. so much coming out, but some people shouldn't be putting them out. Yes. The, what happened before specials was albums, right? Yeah. And so in like the early 2000s is like, as albums, albums were the hottest probably in the late 90s, early 2000s. And then it's a slow thing. It, it aligned with music where yeah. like, album sales just started to decline. Yeah, but there were people who had like number one album. But there were some yes, big people. Big, yes. big ones. So I remember, Right when I was like, I'm probably only, that's why it's a, it was good that I listened to also. I was like five years in maybe. And I was working this weekend with Dave Attell, who's like, he's every comic's favorite, I mean, yeah. my favorite comedian of all time. I mean, he's just, he's amazing. And I was a huge fan. Yeah. I couldn't believe I was working with him. And throughout the weekend, we're like, you know, just talking about this and that. And I was like, yeah, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out whether I, um, I should do it out. I think I should do an album, you know? You think, you think I should do an album? And he goes, uh, do you have an hour you're in love with? And I go, no. Right. And he was like, <sighs> like, I think there's your answer. And he just yeah. kind of walked away. And I was like, oh yeah, like just just because somebody goes, you can yes. record one, yeah. doesn't mean, like that. that's literally when you should go, let's record or let's shoot this, yes. is when you go, oh, this is fully cooked and ready to go. And anything other than that, like, People are getting now these opportunities to shoot these things. And you're like, hey man, like, have you been like, have you even been working this hour? Yeah, sure. Like, it's not, it's not ready. Seneca had this word, uh, euthymia, which he said is the sense of the path that you're on. And he said, not being distracted by the paths that crisscross yours, especially from those who are hopelessly lost. Ooh. And that's extremely hard to have at any age. Like but I think younger, you know, you're like, well, someone's doing this and someone's doing this because you're measuring yourself against all these other people. 
But then as you, even as you become successful, now all of a sudden there's all these things that you can do. Yeah. And it takes an immense amount of discipline. I think also confidence, just like sort of self-awareness and sort of strategy to go like, here's when I'm, here are the things I want to do. Here's when I want to do them. And like not really paying attention to what other people are doing or yeah. everything that's coming, you know, into your inbox. It takes all those things, right? Yeah. And then, because you also, that comparison thing, it also just shifts. You just compare yourself to new people, yeah. more successful people, sure. people who are doing incredible things. But I also feel like you get this, if you're not too caught up in that chase and in your own ego and everything, you actually learn to like really settle into the fact that you you intellectually grasp like, oh, like he's, I'm not comparing myself to what Ryan's doing, whatever he he just did, like he's on his own path. And you kind of get this thing where you're like, you're not, you, you find that it doesn't make you go like, what about me? Yes. Like, you know, yeah. like you did, I did do that at 25. And like now when I hear about that, I don't go like, <gasps> like, what, what am I going to do? You know, like. Well, what, it's also helpful to realize um, like some people are profoundly unhappy mm -hmm. and then other people don't like doing the thing. So like, yeah. like I try to remind myself, like I like writing. Yeah. Like, I like writing books. That's what I enjoy doing. So I didn't get into writing as a means to an end to do something else. That is the end. That is the end, yeah. And so, yes, there's definitely different opportunities and different ways to monetize it. And some of that helps you do the thing. But if I'm like, well, so-and-so just started a company or so-and-so is speaking this many dates a year. I go, that's all great. But my main thing was writing. Like yeah. the reward for getting successful at this thing should not be that I don't get to do the thing anymore. Right. If the reward for me is doing the thing. Yeah. If you hate it, like I'm sure there's stand-up comics who don't, who are good at stand-up comedy, but they love acting. Yeah, yeah. Or they love writing or whatever. So, so for them, it's, they're getting in and then they're getting out. Yeah, totally. But if you don't want to get out, don't follow the people who are getting out or you're going to get out and be unhappy. I've, and I've seen I've seen both examples. Um, it's fascinating to watch because you can tell the ones who like the first acting thing that comes on, they're like, I'll yeah. see you guys Bye. later. And like, and they're fine because they're yeah. happy with that. Yeah. What's more interesting almost is the people who turn down uh, some of those opportunities that come when you have stand-up success. Yeah. And you're like, you don't want to do they're like, I don't want to do that shit. Yeah. And you're like, really? You almost can't believe it at sure. first. Cause we're also kind of, we're all brought up now, now it's shifted. Yeah. So if you're in your twenties now doing stand up, you don't have the same kind of model that we had, but our model was like, you do stand up so that you can sure. get a sitcom. That was the win. Now people turn down those things left and right. But you're also definitely not supposed to say no to things that could pay you a lot of money. Sure. That's stupid, irresponsible. The other thing, though, that is crazy that uh, some people still have are unaware of is that high, like high level, big time touring comedians make way more money. Sure. And even like some of those talent agents who represent actors are just kind of learning this. They're like, yeah, yeah you know, like that comedian is going to lose money yeah. doing your thing. Yeah. Lose. Yeah. Like he has to really want to do it, you know? I remember because I worked at a talent uh, management agency when I first moved to LA and um, I signed this YouTuber mm -hmm. and uh, I was like in the break room or something and some guy came up to me who was like a, a reality star television manager or something and he goes, like, I heard you sign this person on YouTube. He's like, what are you going to do? Commission ad checks? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, he just thought that was like the craziest mm -hmm. thing in the world, uh -huh. which is of course now what everyone wants to do. And of that's course. Where the money is. Yeah. Um, and it, it it's, yeah, first off, if you don't understand how the business actually works, you think you're making a good financial decision, but actually long-term viability and independence is always going to be the best financial decision you can make. But you're, you're just not, you're not supposed to, like, I remember this wasn't that long ago. In 2016, after Trump got elected, I got, and I'd, I'd more or less gotten totally out of the sort of media and marketing world, but I got offered uh, a job as the um, uh, press secretary for like a cabinet member. Mm -hmm. Like, so I'd move to Washington DC, I would be a player. I remember this. Uh, it would have been like a whole twist. Like it would have been, a it, it could, I could, you could see it put aside from the fact that the whole administration is uh, unconscionable and I wanted, 
zero part but of it. But it was that administration that offered you. Yes. Yeah, I remember yeah, yeah. this. Yeah. But it, but it, it would have, it. I mean, who knows what I'd be doing now, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I know what I'd be doing now because I'd be one of these. It didn't work out well for anyone that took those jobs for yeah. the most part. Like the best ones had to like testify for the January 6th commission, right? Yeah, and the yeah. worst ones are way worse. Yeah. But the point is, it's hard when people want you to do stuff to be right. like, I appreciate it, but it's not for me. Yeah, which is what you said kind of, right? Didn't yeah. You, like, mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of remember. I mean, I, honestly, what flashed through my head was my wife's going to support me. I, I had a, I, My youngest was just born. I was like, my wife is going to support me. We're going to do this distance thing. And then I was like, flash forward a couple of years. When I think about why we got divorced, mm -hmm. it's going to be because I took a job in a city that I don't live in and mm -hmm. don't want to live in. I don't want to live in. Yeah, yeah, and I was like... So it doesn't matter how good this is. Yeah. One version of what I want my life to be is to not blow up the life that I currently have. Sure. And then it was like, then it was like the logistics of like, then you got to put all your money in like a trust. And I was like, I, my career was just starting also to, I was like, I work so hard to get to be a person who writes about whatever I want. Then I'm going to have a job. Like, and what, would your, what would your... Job like, have been? It's a. It would be press secretary. It, press secretary to a cabinet. So you're like you do all their media stuff. Yeah, you set, you'd it, be good it at that been, too. Yeah, I definitely could have done yeah. it. Um, I also think I would have liked to have you as my manager back then. Yeah, that would have been fun. That'd been fun. Um, but I also I like again. Yeah, I, I remember I was like these people all drive nice cars. They seem yeah. important. They have lunch at fancy places. Sure. But I was like, what do they fucking do? I know you would have been suits like, every day too, by the way. Yeah. Well, I was like, but they don't do anything. Yeah. I was like, they literally don't do anything. They take a chunk of other people's money. Mm -hmm. I don't hate all agents or managers. Yeah. I like mine and stuff too. But I'm just like, they don't do their their contribution to society is not a creative one, you know. Yeah. And I was like, that doesn't. What are their facilitators basically? Yeah. Right. I was yeah. like, that doesn't. That's not. That doesn't. That doesn't, I think everyone has kind of a unique potential, like a unique thing that they can contribute. Yeah. And you got to figure out what that is and do that. Thing. How long were you a talent manager? I wasn't a manager okay. in the sense because I was a kid, but like I was like an assistant and I was signing people. So I, I was like going places. Yeah. Um. So I was like on a desk for a little while and then I got promoted to being like a new media person Then I dropped out of college and then I got fired in this sort of controversial way. But um, Really? I, did I? I think we might have told the story on your podcast. I know I told really? it on Robert. about. Yeah, I, so I was working for Robert Greene at the time, and mm -hmm. so um, I had his like books on my desk, and uh, one of which was the Forty Eight Laws of Power. And the the manager of the company, the one of the partners at the company, one of the partners was a fan slash friend that's who hired me and who I was working for. But his partner became convinced that I was like plotting or scheming. And this was this after you had worked with Green. I was still working with, I was working with, Ro I was doing these two things at the same time. I got you. Uh, uh, but so then we sort of had it out. And Wait, convinced that you were plotting to like take over? I don't over? know that I was just, yeah, that I was like an ambitious kid who couldn't be trusted and, or something. Who, re who crazy. reads 48 Laws of Power. Yeah, it was, ins it was hilarious. That's and very funny. And then it all, also it sucked. I mean, I hated it. But Yeah. Any but system that makes you do shit for a long time to maybe someday not have to do shit is probably a broken, corrupt system. Yeah, yeah. Like that, you know, they used to start in the mail room. Then there's not really mail yeah. rooms anymore, but then you would start answering phones. Sure. And it was just the fucking worst. Yeah. Some people love it. That's the crazy thing. Some, it's some people's like, they love that business. You know what I mean? Like they, yeah. They, you, you meet them and they're like, I, I started in that room and then I moved up to, and they just, you could just see them light up talking about it. They love it. Yeah. I guess, yeah. I guess I, I should be more understanding. Wait, I want to ask you, because like, you know how sometimes like uh, in conversation, I've seen you on other podcasts. You'll be like, oh, you know, Marcus Aurelius said this. Seneca yeah. used to say this. Are all those? Do you do you stay fresh by still talking about them and, and like you know going back and reading parts of it sometimes because mm -hmm. it can't all just be from when you read it the first time, right? No, no. I think so. I think that's actually an interesting question. I think philosophy isn't something that you read one time. Right. It's not like I read a a novel yeah. or this, like I read it and I got it. It's supposed to be this process that you're engaging in. Mm -hmm. So uh, to quote, Ep Epictetus says, you should write about it, talk about it, share it, uh, and you should be engaging with it. And, yes. that, and that's the process. So, so that's what I'm doing just like as a person who's interested in this stuff. And then I have this extra benefit of, because I talk about it and I have 
supposed to be writing about it. I publish it. Yeah. I ha- I'm engaging with it all the time, all the time which yeah, is yeah. also the philosophical process. Gotcha. So I have a recall because I'm supposed to be popularizing and sharing the idea. So sure. I'm like engaging it makes with sense. it. You know, now this, and I, I think the same thing holds true for, um, I, I say this for health and fitness. Yeah. That you shouldn't like keep it to yourself. You yes. should talk about it because mm-hmm. the more you talk about it, you almost are prompting yourself to be accountable to it. Do you know what I mean? So if you're like, you shouldn't eat this for this reason, you're also having the extra benefit of reminding yourself why you don't eat that. Yeah, it's like when someone's like, so what What do you eat? You go like, you say the things and then you're like, yeah, that's if I haven't eaten that, that's what I should eat. Or like, what do you huh. what do you do for workouts? And it's yeah. like, well, blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, if I leave here- Three days a week, I, I do these things. Uh, and that's then why I, I think it's good to- like have the conversation all the time. Well, it's about making it part of your identity yeah. as opposed to just this thing that you know. Yeah. And then there, there's a benefit for me, obviously also of writing about it is like, I have to be like, oh, I can't, I can't act differently. The, you know? which, which applies to the same thing, sure. right? Because if, like, if you're asking me about like workouts and stuff and I'm like, uh, then I can't be like, I'm just not, I don't, I'm not going to do it this week. Yeah, yeah, you know? sure. Yeah. yeah uh, someone told me like when people ask you to do stuff, and you you can reply like I have a rule that right so like mm. you know like you know like I have a rule I don't accept you know like free gifts or something like yeah. that you're saying to yourself what the rule it's not oh, they don't right. actually need to know right, but you're right. saying to yourself that's my rule it's your reminder and it's reaffirming it's like with boundaries you're like yeah. sorry like I don't go in uh, I don't you know I don't go in other people's hotel rooms or something like yeah, that yeah right right you're like I don't do that. It's weird. Yeah. I know, but that's me. It's not you. Right. And then you don't find yourself in people's hotel rooms. You shouldn't be. <laughs> sure. You know? sure, sure. Or if you're like, I don't do drugs. You know, yeah. like I, I don't, I don't do that. No, that's the thing, man. I'm completely sober. Yeah, I'm comp- yeah. If you're just like sometimes, sometimes yeah. not. Then, yeah. then someone's like, Are you sure. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good way to uh, approach it. Yeah, yeah. But I, I also some of the reasons i say them is then they get cut up and they go into clips and things yeah sure <laughs> there's also the, a performative element of yeah. it that's a little weird but yeah. um yeah people are like how do you know all this stuff it's like well it's my that's like my job it is like, that's and you're literally, literally like i was just in your office yeah and and there's just like crates of notes <laughs> so like yeah i could see i now like even seeing that goes oh okay like at least like i could see you're writing this chapter you access this information you reminded yourself of this quote from this, you know, yes. it, it makes sense how it kind of is. When I actually learned that as a research assistant, that's how I started. Like my job was to find that stuff for Robert. That's crazy. So uh, you you sort of develop a habit and then that habit generates the stuff that you do. 48 Laws of Power to me, by the way, feels like somebody talking about like the Godfather movie. Yeah. And then, and you being like, oh, I haven't seen, like I haven't read that. Oh, but really? I, but I've heard... It, like I'm saying, I've yeah. heard it talked about in the same way. Sure. You know, like this is the unbelievable, like the best. And I still, I'm like, I have to read this book. Well, Bill Simmons had a thing where he's like, you should always have one movie that you haven't seen. Mm-hmm. That, and, and he's like, I've never seen The Big Lebowski. And he, he won't see it just because it bothers people, you know? Oh, just to like get a rise out of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of funny. So, th- but there are things like that where you're like, at a certain point, you're just like, I think like that ship, the, the ship has passed. And like, I feel it'd be weird to go back. The funny thing is, if if it's super influential yeah. in pop culture, and you wait a while, you'll see derivative versions of it, yeah. and then the original won't hit. It oh, won't. Sure. It won't have the same impact. If you see a mo- like a comedy, comedy especially, because what happens is a comedy that is a breakout comedy yeah. has something in it that's kind of, mm. even though there's no or- totally original premises and stuff, there's something. There's some quality of it that they're doing, kind of. For the first time sure and then when it's a hit there will be all these knockoff versions of it and you will be on if you don't watch that original you'll be unaware that you're watching knockoff versions of this big thing and then when you finally go see it you'll be like oh i i've seen like yeah yeah 20 versions of this it, it won't have the same impact on you it's also a little awkward like i remember actually in jim gaffigan's first special mm-hmm. the comedy central one he has a joke he's like has anyone seen the movie heat you know, mm-hmm. and they're like, that's from eight years ago. It's uh-huh. like, but I want to talk about it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're just like, you don't want to be, you've been pretending that you've seen it mm-hmm. or just like not admitting that you haven't seen it and now you have. And, but to talk about it is to admit that you were late. Yeah. I'm late on, I'm late on shows almost all the time. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm, I'm out, I'm out at night. 
I'm performing at night. Um, I do have a little bit of that thing too, that I don't know what the origin of it is where everybody's like, have you seen? And I'm like, oh, fuck off. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, like I, and then whatever. when I do watch those things, I'm like, this is amazing. Yeah, same. And I kick myself. Same. That's, I still remember breaking, but everyone's talking about breaking, but I'm like, what, the, what is everybody yeah. talking about? And then I started breaking bad as the final season was airing. Yeah. And I was like, this is outrageously good. Yeah. Like, this, have you guys seen like, this show? Everyone was like, everyone's yeah, I know. <laughs> um, it was the most amazing show. But yeah, I mean, I, um, yeah, I haven't seen a lot of the big shows I completely miss. I just did that with Succession. Like I started it just as yeah. I was finishing and it was, it was amazing. Yeah. But also I found that as I've had kids and then as I've gotten, like, I, it's not that I don't, it's like I don't need whatever those shows do for people. And so like what I really want to watch is like a rerun of The Office or Seinfeld for mm -hmm. like the 8,000th time mm -hmm. or sports. Like yeah. I want to watch something that like it, the stakes are very low. Yeah. And I don't want to be emotionally manipulated. You know? I also feel like, yeah, I mean, I, I also have this thing where I'll watch two episodes or something. Yeah. And not. But one of the things about streamers that I don't think we talk about enough is like, okay, so the old model was like, it's got to be good enough that you're talking about it and then you look forward to it every week. Yeah. Now the model is like, basically, they're just trying to steal as much time from you as humanly possible. Yeah. Right? So you watch one hour of Bloodlines or whatever, and then it doesn't have to be that good. It just has to be good enough in the last five minutes that you let the autoplay start the next episode. Yeah. And so realizing that you're just kind of being emotional, for me, realizing that I was just kind of being emotionally toyed with to s spend hours vegged out in one sitting, yeah. it kind of broke the spell of it for me. And then I go like, I like feeling good. And these things inherently make me feel bad. Mm -hmm. Same thing with like Twitter. The point of Twitter is to make you Stay there. Hate yourself and yeah. humanity enough that you keep tweeting and yeah. checking. And you could also just not do that. Yeah. I've I've all but abandoned and not not because I have some grand plan to do so. Almost all social media. Yeah. I mean, the only social media that I'm active on is Instagram. Yeah. Um, somebody manages like does TikTok for me. Somebody does Facebook for me. I don't even know. I don't even yeah, know. How who to are log those in. people? Yeah. And um Twitter just kind of sits there. I, I I sometimes just go, oh, I should repost that there. Yeah. I, I don't really think about it. Right. I mean, that's sort of you know, I'm happy about it. I'm not it's like not good I'm for not you. I'm not bummed yeah. that that's the reality of it. I get more done when I'm not on those things. I'm never on social media, and I go, I'm so glad I did that. Yeah. Like afterwards, I never feel good. Mm -hmm. There's like, it's not shame, but it's just like a that that triggered things that are not conducive in me to liking my life. Sure. Chris so, Stefano, a buddy of mine, a really funny comedian, a little yeah, while ago. Yeah, he's a couple times. He's yeah, great. he's fantastic. He, um, he told me a few months back that he gave somebody else the login. And what he does is when, he, when you see a post of his, he has recorded it, but he sends it to that person to post. Yeah. So he's like, I don't see anything. That's how it is for how all of it gets done and it's scheduled. Yeah. And every once in a while I'll check to see how stuff's doing or yeah. get messages from people that I like I actually know. Cause that's yeah. the problem is that it is also how you interact with people or sure. you you find people that you want to be friends with because sure. you're fans of their work yeah. and they connect with you're like, yeah. oh shit, this person tagged me. I didn't know. That's like that's a sort of a high level cool thing to have. But like uh like when I see like like Elon Musk has eleven kids. Is he, he have 11? He has 11 kids. He runs three or four companies. He's the richest person in the world. And he tweets like 90 times a day. Almost like he owns the thing. But like, he should be too busy. No, I, I completely agree. It's like, agree. what's wrong with and you? And also, if like, if you're in that position, yeah. let's say you send some tweets, you're like, all right, this is like some, you know, kind of messages I yeah. went out. He's just like replying to a guy who's like, your shit sucks. It's, it's like cat like, turd six said something anti-Semitic and, and I'm going to be like, wow, you make it, a good point. He's replying to people who, and he's like making fun of them. I'm like, you have time for this? How do you have time for this? Well, he's like seeking out culture war issues to, to like get mad about. I don't understand it at all. I really don't understand it. It's something is breaks in people's brains and in their soul. And then it's a feedback loop where it yeah. makes you worse. Like something you, about this too, the the actual purchase of Twitter, yeah. I think might be related to his activity on it because he 
you know, he made an offer that he was then did not want to. Yes. And then the SEC, everybody got involved. They're like, yeah. no, you, you, this, you know, they're holding you to this now. And so this like, it, you know, on paper, I mean, I don't know how anybody looks at this and goes, this is a great investment. <laughs> yeah, no, um, it's, it's, it may be the worst investment of all time. It seems insane. Yeah. And, and also when you compare prior purchases of massive social media companies by individuals and or companies for large amounts of money have all ended in disaster. I mean, disaster. So when you look at an acquisition of something like this for, and you go, it's Twitter yeah. for $44 billion. And you're telling me that like, this is like a, a savvy, and I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm. Has anyone torched their brand in a shorter amount of time? Here's, you know, the other thing that's, uh, I, I have never heard, I don't know, I've never heard people analyze this, but like, you know, one of the big things in, in brands globally is brand recognition. Yeah. Right. Like one of the most recognizable brands would be like Rolex. Everyone yeah. knows what that sure. is. Uh, a Coke, uh, Mercedes, right. And Twitter is like a pretty well-known thing. And to change the name of it. Oh, that's just a, stupid on a whole. But that's other just like, it's a strange thing to do. But I mean, people liked and admired and respected Elon no, Musk I know. It's like a very, it's 18 a, months ago. It's a very strange, it's a strange path. And here's the thing. He has a bunch of super Got fanatics. People. They just suck. Yeah. He's, his, he has people who are like, they, but they admire him in a way that doesn't even seem like somewhat rational. They're, yeah. they're, it's a messiah thing, right? Yes. Where they're like, this guy is a god, and they actually believe that his his motives in everything is to better humanity. I'm yeah. like, are you fucking out of your mind that you think that all of these things are just? I'm just here to help people. You buy that? Yeah. And you ask these people, and they completely do buy it. They think that it's it's just the the betterment of all humanity is why he's doing all these things like you think that's why he spent 44 billion dollars because he's such a champion of free speech like it's it's i don't know man it feels like i'm living in uh you know like make believe land yeah. when when you when you hear these arguments and the the worst part is when you decide to engage in that conversation cuz you know how nonsensical it is it's like i'm not even going to talk to one of those people about it well one of my favorite ideas from the Stoics is Marcus Rios says, you know, remember you always have the power to have no opinion. Yeah. And uh, he fundamentally lacks the ability to just not have opinions about stuff. It's like Paul Pelosi gets uh, viciously attacked by a crazy person. And it's like, I'm going to speculate about why that happened. Yeah. And I'm going to speculate something that if true, if not true, is abhorrently cruel. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so what if I just, what if, what if I didn't have an opinion? And then if I do have an opinion, what if I just kept it to my fucking self? That That's like a sort of basic discipline and decency that a human being has to cultivate. Sure. And you see how he is this incredibly successful person who just makes his life harder over and over and over again. Why do you think that is? He's bored? I think, he, I think he's bored. I think he uh, has no one around him that can tell him anything. And then I think he's also fundamentally unhealthy and unbalanced in the sense that it's not normal to be doing all this stuff. Yeah. So there's probably like uppers and downers, you mm -hmm. know, that maintain the whole thing. And that is bad for the human regulatory system. And you also chase, I think, um, cause you experience this, I've experienced this, which is when somebody goes, man, you're brilliant, right? Yeah. They go, you're the genius. Yeah. And there's this part of you the first time that like, you know, you get like this, dopamine mm -hmm. hit from it right they're like you're fucking so brilliant yeah and but there's this part of your brain that goes that is a over the top superlative yeah like that's hyperbole sure. and it it's and, and you, you get regulated and you go like you're not yes right you go or you tell your you're like yeah. i'm not like it's nice to hear but i'm not and i think when you hear it from so many people yes you have this choice where you go like, maybe I can just kind of like float in just this space. Just live in that all the time. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think he kind of does. Mm. I think he kind of goes like, he likes the fact that people, like a, a serious newscaster will start their interview with by being like, you are a genius. Yeah. And he's just like, <laughs> and I, I, I mean, he's obviously a very bright guy. Yeah. I'm not saying that he's, he's not, but um, I think you start to like want to live that, you know, yeah. like to feel that 24 seven. You have a great bit that I love, I won't make you perform it unless you want to, but it, it's about how uh, uh, once you had kids, you just like, you didn't have time for certain stuff anymore. Uh, yeah. And I do think 
of all people, Elon Musk should have no time for this. Yeah. But even if you only have one kid or if anything, you don't have time to get in arguments with strangers on the internet. You, you just don't. don't have time for it. No, you don't. You got to you gotta post and release. You yeah. got to move on. Yeah. You, you're just consumed by too many other things. You yeah. Know? Like even, I don't know, I, I have a lot of freedoms because of my, my job, um, but even today, you know, come here, I got to split, I yeah. got to go to a thing, then I got to get the kids, yeah. take them to this class. And then it's like, yeah, you just regulated with um, things to do. But that you, it's important, like, they go like, oh, like family, like ties you down. It yeah. ties you down to reality. Yeah. Because to earth, because yeah. you can't do anything you want every, whenever you want it. No. And, and it's actually important that you have those burdens. Yeah. Because they, it's like ballast. It's the last holes that keep you in line, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're just like, Jesus, they're so funny, man. But yeah, no, they, 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 I was thinking about how, how, you know, I was thinking about on the way here, how my kids are the ones who have made me like be aware and laugh at my, um, my outrage when I, like when I've gotten upset. Yeah. And I'm like, no one's ever done that to me, you know, in my whole life. Yeah. Like I'm driving. They didn't take it seriously. They don't take it because you're a joke of a person. Yeah. And, and you are when you're doing that. I'm driving the car. Yeah. And I think about this, that like how everyone else has reacted. I'm driving the car and it's like, you know, whatever they're doing back there, I'm like, knock it off. Yeah. Hey guys, seriously. Hey, if you know, you know, yeah. I'm going to count to three. Yeah. You know what? When we get home then, taking the stuff away, guys. And then I'm like, I've said, about, you know, I'm like, <laughs> God damn it. And as I'm doing that, my youngest is laughing so hard and I'm in a full, like yeah, yeah. full, <laughs> like rage. Knock it the fuck he knows you're totally impotent. Yeah. You can't do anything about and it. Then you won't. He's like, he's laughing so hard that I turn back and I start to like laugh to myself. Yeah. And, and that's the part that's never happened. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, sure. When you go, I'm fucking serious. Like everyone's like, all right, all right, all right. You know, like, but this is the only time where I've done that mm. and then laughed and I'm driving. And I'm like, that got me nowhere. Like, how silly do I look? Then I even in my own head go, this is not worth getting as upset as I've just got. And then this kid is just like, do that thing again. Like, he thinks it's a bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know? No, uh, as an adult, you have made up that it's not pathetic and ridiculous to be yelling in your closed metal box at someone else traveling 80 miles oh, an yeah. hour away from you in their own metal box. Yeah. But your kid, that's the most absurd thing in the entire absurd, world. Absurd, yeah. Yeah. They've also checked me in a different, like at home, I'm very upset about something and I've had them be like, hey, I'm like, what? He's like, I'm a kid, you need to talk to me. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck, man? Like, and I start laughing again. And then I realized that he's right. That's the crazy thing. Is this a fucking seven year old just being like, as a, as a kid, you just need to talk to me in a normal voice. And I'm like, okay. They we, they Could you please not paint the walls? They, like, they weaponize stuff, and it's so brilliant. Like I was, I was asking my son. I was like, hey, I, I need you to do this or whatever. And he goes, is it okay if I say no? Like, yeah, yeah. I was like, where did you, that's that's like, or, or my, I, you got to put on your clothes and be like, my body, my choice. You know, and he like, get these things that actually, that's actually like a good point. And that is a thing that you should know. And I'm glad that you know it. And why am I the only person that you're using it against? Yeah. You know, like yeah. a stranger, you'd probably be like, sure, put a new shirt on me. Like, yeah, that, yeah. but like me, I'm doing it and you're going to get in my way about it. But like, so like, where did you get this? And, and it just stops you. It's like when he was like, is it okay if I say no? It was so earnest that it stopped me cold. And I was like, I mean, I guess yeah, like, yeah. it doesn't, this what I'm asking you to do, I don't even know why I'm asking you to do it. It doesn't actually matter. Sure. So sure. Yes, you can you, you can, can choose to say yeah. you should choose to say no. And it kind of just stops you just like that. It does. And it really makes you think about how stupid things are. Yeah. Like how, like, why do we have to be on time? What are these rules well, about? I don't, and you're I don't like, know why we have to be on time. Mm. I just made up in my head that it would be bad if we got here at ten oh six instead of ten. Yeah. And I don't even want to go to the thing that I'm rushing us towards. Yeah. And you don't want to go, so we should take our time. Then we don't have to be there as long. Yeah. It's like, great point. The other day, he picked up a copy of The Daily Stove, which is on the counter. He goes, oh, look, it's Daddy's book, The Daily Butthole. Just like, great. Appreciate that. Yeah. And it just, so there's also just an inherent 
and repeated humbling mm-hmm. that All having kids time. is. I get called so many names. Butthole <laughs> is like one of the most popular. Yes. Um, yeah, the other day I couldn't get this flashlight that I plugged in. It wouldn't come on. And then I, I come in the room and it's on. I go, how'd you get that to work? And he goes, I used my ass. I go, hey, man. <laughs> I go, no, seriously, how'd you get it to work? He goes, I did. And I go, I go, I really want to know. Yeah. And then he comes over and he shows me that he used his ass to like to push it into the wall. And I go, okay. He goes, maybe you could try using your ass. And I go, okay, thank you very much. Like, but yeah, it's a lot of insults. I get a lot of insults from these guys. I, I have learned like whenever my kids say that they saw something or that something happened, that I just have to believe them. Yeah. You know, they're like, I saw a monkey riding a tricycle. And I'm sure you did. And then sure enough, there's like a monkey riding a tricycle. Yeah. Actually, what happened with your son? I, I don't remember exactly. So I won't like, you don't have to say what it is. But your son has like a weird nickname, right? Mm-hmm. And my son goes like, can we send this to computer? And I go like, yeah. what the fuck are you talking yeah, about? Yeah. And I went to my wife and I was like, the fuck is who is this person that he's talking about and uh it was your kid yeah yeah you know he wanted to like send him something from minecraft or whatever and i go oh okay i'll just assume like i assume you don't know what you're talking about because you never know what you're talking about and in fact you always know what you're talking about and i'm the one who doesn't know what i'm talking about. that's totally true they say things that are you know when it sounds outrageous it it is actually true yes yeah it it happens all the time all the time no, it, like I, I remember he would come in our room in the middle of the night and go like, something woke me up. And we're like, sure you did. You just want to come in our bed. And then one night I slept in his bed mm-hmm. for so, or I fell asleep in his bed. And then sure enough, at like two in the morning, something my neighbors were doing woke me up. Oh. And I was like, it was actually a really good lesson to me, which is like, hear them, like yeah. actually put them in. Your, yeah. Because again, they might be wrong. Like there, there isn't actually a monster in right. their closet, but it turns out there, there's this thing that's lighting up and yeah. it looks like eyes yeah. and that's terrifying. And so it's also this, hum- like you think you know, but you don't. And if you just listen, they'll tell you. And then the other thing I've tried to remember, this is a great piece of advice I got about parenting. They said, um, uh, the language of children is behavior. Mm-hmm. So like they don't know what they're experiencing and they couldn't articulate it if they did. So their behavior is telling you something. So you have to listen to that also. That's really interesting. Yeah, the behavior. And and they basically tell you, they do tell you, they lie, yeah. but they do tell you what happened. They yes. don't, they, they, every time like they tell me something that they saw or experienced, um, my kid just got into somewhat of a fight yeah. at school. One of them did. And I was like, but I mean, I learned, you know, the story changed, yeah. but the bones were sure. true. You know, the bones were true. Yeah. It's, um, it's like my, I don't think my kids have ever said, I'm tired. I'm hungry. Yeah. But when my oldest hit his brother, he was saying, I'm tired or I'm hungry. Sure. You know, it's like yeah. they're speaking. They oh, just don't have the words to say those yeah. things. And then, so if I can sort of go, okay, they're, they're speaking with their behavior and I have to like, we, I'm reading you loud and clear that it's time to leave this party. Yeah, You know, like you are telling me, cause actually we found this with my son. He would do this thing where he, he'd be like, I'd be like, you know, if you throw sand at the beach again, we're going to have to go home. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, oh, he wants to go home. He wants to go home. He wants right, to go right, home. Right. And actually, cause why is he throwing it after we said this? It's like, oh, he, he didn't know he could just ask to go home. Right. And cause he didn't, he didn't think that he has the power to tell the whole family that we can leave. But he does. He could say like, "Hey, I'm ready to go," and yeah. be like, "Okay, well, we'll he doesn't wrap know up." How and, to do that, really? Yeah, and so going like, "Oh, they're they're trying to talk to you. They just don't have the words to do that." That's really interesting. And then people are talking to you all the time, like, you know, like your spouse isn't being a bitch. She's tired or hungry, right? <laughs> right? Or like, um, the the person in front of you is having a hard time, like they're not a monster. They're just having a hard time. They're not being that way on purpose. They would rather not be this way. Right. You can, it doesn't make it always possible to put up with it, but it makes it easier to put up with. If you have awareness. Yes. Because I think the big thing is that like most of us, a lot of us are living in this place in our head where voluntarily or involuntarily, you're not considering any of that. You're yes. not considering it with your own kids. You could be like, the fuck would you throw the sand again for? Yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. You're not and then you have to go like, oh, like you have to take yourself to the place where you go, I should be reading behaviors. Yes. I should be reading the fact that like 
I, I met I, I met up with Ryan today, and like the, he was, you were acting a certain, you were, you know, whatever, like threw a glass on the ground, like yeah. I should I should read into that. There's something that's causing that, you know. But the fucked up thing is we do it for ourselves. We go like, I'm not an asshole. Right. I'm tired. Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, but then for other people, we're like, they're an asshole. Yes. I, I read this thing one time about um, the justice system, about how when somebody who's close to you commits a crime, but you know them well, your yeah. wife, sure, you plead to the court, like she should she, please yes. show mercy, yes, because you know this person so well. So if it's someone I know and care for, treat them this way, yes. When it's a stranger, you're like fucking drop the hammer on him, yeah. Like put him away forever, right? Yeah. So it's like it all depends on your relationship, sure. To it and like your relationship to yourself. Obviously, you're not closer to anyone, so it's always like please have some compassion for what I did. They, I, I read a, about a study one time that was saying like they they could look at judges where they're they're just seeing the same case over and over again, so like a traffic court judge mm -hmm. or a, or whatever, where it's the, like they could compare apples to apples. And the judges were more lenient in the morning and they would get less lenient towards lunch. And then after lunch, they would get lenient again. And then towards the end of the day, wow. just because they're tired they're and hungry. hungry. Yeah. And you're just like, oh yeah. Wow. So we think, you know, we think we have these philosophical principles, these ethics or, you know, these standards we do, but then our biology and our physiology is acting on it at all times. And we're pretty forgiving of ourselves. We go like, I am not... A bad person. I just lost my temper in this moment. That was the worst moment right. of my life. But then, other people we see as fixed or conscious yeah. or culpable for I mean, everything. You they knew did. better. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But you didn't, or they did knew better, but they did it anyway. Just like you know, you're not supposed to eat donuts, but you passed a donut shop and yeah. you bought one. It doesn't say anything about you as a person necessarily. You made it. You made a choice. Yeah. A, a, an individual action that doesn't necessarily represent the whole. Yeah. And the other lesson here is to have those move your court time to 8 a.m. or 1 30. Yeah. Sounds like, right? Well, and then also probably like rich lawyers know this and they uh, assign like different like, people. What time are we? Uh, yeah. let's, well, let's just yeah. reschedule. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. people, there's there's a whole other level that some people are operating on yeah. that you, uh, some clueless guy who's never, never gotten yeah. in trouble before yeah. comes from that, you know, ends up with the, the 11 50 court appearance yeah. and does three years in jail. Because he didn't, he wasn't afforded the same. Because judge wanted a sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, to go back to that welfare thing we're talking, like the reason poor people eat bad food mm -hmm. and they use their SNAP benefits to do it is that one, they tend to live in food deserts. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't go to Whole Foods where they're yeah. choosing between these things. Sure. They go to, they're choosing between 7-Eleven and Food Mart or whatever. Yeah. And then also like willpower, they tend to think is a finite resource. So if, if you have to ride the bus to work every day, like you're gonna be more tired than the person who drives their luxury car to work every day. And then when it comes time to choose what they're gonna eat for dinner, yeah, like they're not gonna be like, I'm gonna make something healthy. They're yeah. like literally just any calories. Anything, just put something in. Yeah. 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 We really talk. Oh, we're good? Yeah. Uh, oh, cause you just gotta go, right? All right, you good? Yeah. Anything we need to talk about? I don't think so. I think that's everything. Uh, oh, yeah. I did love the Ted Cruz bit, though. I thought it was amazing. Oh, thanks. I, thanks. I could see why you cut it, but it was spectacular. Well, I, I like to say, you know, in that, um, I say in the bit, and I've said it off stage, I said it may or may not have been. Yes. Yeah. The uh, member of Y'all Qaeda, as they call it. <laughs> <laughs> Great guy. Yeah. The funny thing, I'll tell you this, the funny thing about that bit is, because um, I, I remember, you know, like, we always say that, like, you know, like we all talked about COVID, right? Yeah. So during the Trump years, all of us had at least, it wasn't necessarily a joke, even like, um, like a harsh, I hate Trump yeah. bit. You just talked about him in some way. Sure, sure, sure. I had a bit that I don't even fully recall. Like that's how sparingly I did it. But I had a bit about him. About the person. That about you know, Trump. Not, okay. I'm sorry, about Trump. And, um, and you would find that, it would land really well, and then you could you could tell that you were in like a red market. Yeah. Even though it, my point is that even though it wasn't like a sure. a harsh butt bashing Trump, but it was more like about his personality, his bravado and stuff. And so you you know you just kind of you just register these things in your head. Yeah. You're like, oh, that told me something. Like I was in Green Bay, I remember, and they were like, mm, they kind of pulled yeah. back, and I was like, oh, this is a real red market, you know. Fine, kind of move on. It's not even my forte to do. But the funny thing was, I'm telling that that Ted Cruz bit. You know, it's like a, it's the final 
thing, the reveal of saying his name. And that shit killed in every market, yeah. including in Canada, in Central America, I did it. I did it in Europe. And you're like, this person is loathed universally. Yeah. And then you kind of go, how does this person get elected? Yeah. If they're, they're like, because I'm saying it in every city and everybody is like cheering for this guy being a bad guy in this story. Even the other senators don't like Ted Cruz. He's I like mean, the I, least popular senator. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I remember I asked Al Franken that, yeah. and he was... He has he, a good joke about that. He had a really funny bit about it. And yeah. he was just like, even the shittiest people think he's a piece of shit. <laughs> like, he was, he was pretty... Yeah, it was pretty great. But yeah, it's funny that someone could be that universally disliked. How do you wake up every day? I don't know, and I don't even know, like... I you, almost respect it. I do, too. It's like, yeah. it's almost a version of we're saying, like, ignore the... No, don't read the comments. Yeah. Don't be like... He has to really be able to be like, nope, I'm right, <laughs> like, to... To everyone. It's pretty wild. Yeah. There's like a Michael Scottness to it. Yeah. Like you're just the worst. Everyone thinks you're a fool, but you there's some part of you that doesn't allow you to realize that or you would change. You're like, I'm pretty great. Yeah. 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 Well, this is amazing, man. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. I'm sorry that I had to split early. Good. Yeah. We did we did a lot. Okay. Sweet.